Welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Emerald Bogue, a member of City Club's Forum Board. For more than a century, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. We're gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel and are joined by thousands of people via X-Ray FM and its radio stations at 107.1, 91.1, KGW's website, Facebook feed and news app, and Open Signal's community media television stations. We are incredibly grateful for all the work they do in bringing Friday Forum to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our volunteers and staff enable us to put Oregon's best civic programs forward week after week. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who's made this event possible. I spent my early years on Hawaii's Big Island, where there are frequently small earthquakes related to an active volcano. Later, living in Oregon, the Spring Break Quake was a cute name for a relatively small earthquake in Oregon. I was among many who were pretty blasé about earthquakes, but that has all changed. Between the devastation we've seen abroad, from major quakes, to the very solid science that says that we're due for a big one here, we've collectively moved into a space of being more aware of what will happen. But then what? Is building a home kit enough? How am I going to get to my kids if they're on the other side of the river? And is our house too old to handle it all anyway? And assuming that we're OK, how will life ever get back to normal? So these are the big questions that today's panel works every day to take on. And I will introduce them now. Yumei Wang is a geotechnical engineer at the, at the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. She focuses on building resilience to natural hazards and earthquake risk management, including schools, emergency response facilities, and critical infrastructure. As resilience coordinator, Jay Wilson leads Clackamas County's efforts to reduce risks and assets hazards, including flood, earthquake, wildlife, or I'm sorry, wildfire, <laughs> not wildlife, <laughs> volcano, and climate change impacts. Megan Neal supports a team of engineers bridge operators, and maintenance staff at Multnomah County who provide capital planning, project delivery, and asset management for six of Portland's bridges. Jana uh, Papa Ephthemiu coordinates citywide planning for emergency response, continuity of operations, and hazard mitigation through Portland's Bureau of Emergency Management. And moderating our panel is Multnomah County Commissioner Jessica Vega-Peterson. Commissioner Vega-Peterson Vega has served on the county board since 2016, following four years in the Oregon House of Representatives. In the legislature, she, carry, uh, she chaired the House Energy and Environment Committee and championed the renewal of the Clean Energy Fuels Program and legislation to remove coal from Oregon's energy mix. At Multnomah County, she is focused on housing and homelessness, sustainability, early learning, and transportation. She is the co-chair of the Earthquake Ready Burnside Bridge Policy Committee and a leader in the effort to prepare the Burnside Bridge for a major seismic event. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Good afternoon, everyone. In July 2015, a wake-up call, call rang throughout our region in the form of a New Yorker article by Katherine Schultz titled, The Really Big One. That's when Cascadia subduction zone became a household world, and it seemed everyone I know became thoroughly concerned about the potential for earthquake happening in Oregon and how prepared or unprepared they were. The article described our region's susceptibility to experiencing an earthquake up to 9.2 in magnitude. To ground us in the science of exactly what that means, I'd like to start with you, May. There's been a lot of talk about the big one over the past several years in our region. What does that mean when it comes to an earthquake in our region? Why are we calling it a big one and not a small one or a medium one? <laughs> well, we're calling it a big one because off the coast of Oregon is uh, the Cascadia Fault. And this fault runs 600 miles long and it stretches from Northern California up to British Columbia. It can generate big earthquakes on the order of magnitude nine. In fact, this type of fault generates the biggest earthquakes. And in the past, it has generated over 40 uh, very big earthquakes. So we're due for another one. 
and when we are hit, the ground will shake for three to five minutes. Uh, there will be lots of landslides and liquefaction. Liquefaction is mostly going to be in places in river valleys, especially right along the river. And about 15 minutes after that, a uh, tsunami would come and hit the low-lying areas. So the impact to uh, our area will be great. And one of the main reasons why is because scientists didn't know about this big active fault until the late 80s. And then in the mid-90s, the building code kept, caught up with this. So we have a lot of building damage that we expect. And then as far as lifeline infrastructure systems, like power, water, transportation, communication, and fuel, we expect downtime for those on the order of many weeks um, and even many months. So, um, so now I see why it's called the big one. Um, but how can you really measure the scale of an event like this? Earthquake professionals think about uh, impacts from earthquakes in terms of death, dollar, and downtime. So death, how many people might be injured or even killed, dollars, how much it might cost, downtime, how long is it gonna take for us to get our society back up and running again. Uh, Dogami, the agency I work for, uh, issued earlier this year a study looking at this three county area. We have about 1.8 million people in Multnomah, Clackamas, and uh, Washington counties, and if an earthquake uh, were to be a magnitude nine, in the winter, in the daytime, we would have the most damage. We would have um, lots of uh, landslides and, and liquefaction because the ground would be saturated. We would have more people in older vulnerable buildings in the commercial districts than if they were at home. And our study shows that on the order of 30,000 people would be injured. That's almost 2% of our population. And of those, about 8%, uh, I, I'm sorry, about 80, uh, about 8,000 uh, could be seriously injured or even killed. Um, as far as dollars, we're looking at $30 billion. That's 10% of our building value. And a lot of people would be displaced from their homes. So uh, on the order of 100,000 people would need either shelter or to stay with family and friends. So this is why the state has been really emphasizing to people, have a two-week ready kit. So I know that there's been a lot of talk, and I've heard a lot of talk when we talk about a Cascadia event, about those immediate impacts that you've just described. But can you tell us more about what impacts the downtime aspects? Right, the downtime really refers to when we can get back to our day-to-day -day lives, when children can go back to school, when uh, people can go back to work. Uh, in a storm, people are used to having, um, you know, the, t the, the, the power go out for a little while. Could be minutes, could be hours, and in bad cases, it could be days. But for a Cascadia earthquake, we're looking at weeks or months. And imagine uh, no refrigerator working at home, uh, no cell phone, the streets are dark because the street lights don't work, there's no traffic lights, uh, water isn't getting pumped to your house. So this is why the state has been uh, encouraging Lifeline owners to make sure that they have seismic mitigation action plans so that we can get recovered very, very quickly. And just as one example, for earlier this year, the state has now started to require water districts to have these action plans. And we see uh, water districts adding these seismic shutoff valves to their very big tanks, so that instead of having damage and losing all the water, they'll be water preserved for our use. Thank you, Yume. So, um, Jay, you may paint a pretty bleak picture of what we're looking at, both in terms of immediate impact and um, d the downtime aspects. From your perspective as a county um, resilience coordinator, how prepared or unprepared are we as a region? Uh, okay, let me transition here from uh, the physical context to the, uh, to the societal context. Um, 
I would say regionally, we're certainly as strong as we've ever been, and we've got a lot of momentum that's been building from uh, what we've learned and enacted since a, a number of earthquakes across the globe that we've used for, for lessons and for translating those impacts to a real world understanding of what we may face. I think uh, some of the strongest advances that we've made are around awareness like we're talking about here today and having a forum like this that's as supported as it is and, a, and having a national, if not international, platform for our issues through a, an article like the New Yorker. Um, I think uh, this genuinely scares people. And um, I think for me, what I hope to do is to translate that fear and that worry into action. And that action, I hope, can first start with acceptance, that if, if we can kind of get beyond the, the uncertainty of some of the science. Will it be an eight? Will it be a nine? When will it happen? In a decade? In, in 50 years? But if we can accept that this is inevitable and that it's going to take decades for us to initiate a lot of the changes we know we have to do, then I think a lot of the uncertainty can translate into a much clearer picture of what we need to do and how we need to work together for these things. Um, you know, that this community that we all live in and cherish was developed for the most part, well before we knew this was a, a, a probability here. And so we're not going to change all of that built infrastructure overnight. I think, um, you know, what's the real challenge for us is because we have so few earthquakes in this area that drives us to have to replace damaged buildings and vulnerable buildings, then we have to learn from other places. We have to make this about our imagination, really, is what we can achieve and how we can leverage that together and how we can't wait to learn from the earthquake. Because if we wait until it happens, we've basically given up and lost. So the action, we need to start here right now today. That's wonderful. So that's what we're doing today. And um, I'm feeling a little bit better now that you've talked. Um, but I really, you know, when it comes to what our community um, needs to do and what we have to do, um, what uh, are the different levels of government responsible for when it comes to getting ready? How are those responsibilities divided up? That's a really good question because I don't think that's necessarily transparent for a lot of people, especially if you don't work in government and see the way these things operate. Um, at the national level is really where a lot of policy is generated, um, and it's often very generalized uh, of how it would actually apply uh, down at a local level. Um, if that's uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency that has grants to do retrofitting, for example, um, then the state of Oregon you know, has to come in and, one, be willing and ready to administer those, but also to be an advocate for the local communities to, to implement them. And so, you know, the local community is really where, as they say, the rubber hits the road, but it's, it's all dependent on the, the, the political appetite for taking advantage of those, leveraging windows of opportunity when something happens and there's a, an interest in that. Um, and, uh, and also that relationship between public will and political will uh, for things like voting on bond measures to create programs to, to retrofit our schools. That, that issue around how the, the public's interest in these issues generates political will and the, the need for all of us to collectively do this is probably the, the linchpin of how this has to work. Thank you. So. Uh, let's change topics just a little bit to one that's near to my heart, um, bridges. So one of the unique challenges is that our most populated region is divided by a river. Multnomah County is responsible for six of the bridges across the Willamette River and has chosen to focus on the Burnside Bridge. Megan, of all the bridges, why Burnside? Well, um, to kind of set the stage for the answer to that question, I just want to acknowledge a little bit about our history of development of bridges over the Willamette River and then talk into the future. So um, as it stands now, uh, the Sauvies Island Bridge, the Selwood Bridge, and the Tillicum Crossing were built to current seismic code. 
However, if you think about all the lanes that the bridges carry across the geographic divide of the Willamette River, from the St. John's out on down to the Selwood, the bridges that are resilient today, there's really not a lot of capacity on them relative to all of the lanes that um, are out there now. And they're actually quite difficult to get to in terms of regionally. Um, and there's also some additional constraints of um, overpasses like 405 collapsing on top of the approaches to the Tillicum that sort of render it um, not immediately useful after an earthquake. So given all that, as well as the fact that regionally we have established a system of emergency transportation routes that um, connect our region uh, together and provide those routes for emergency responders, as well as routes, key routes for people to get home after a disaster. Um, Amongst the system of uh, lifeline routes, there's actually three downtown that cross the Willamette River. They are the, um, the Markham Bridge and the Fremont Bridge and then the Burnside Bridge. And um, from an agency perspective, you know, ODOT is really focused on the statewide resiliency plan. And um, in the Portland region, there isn't really, uh, for the foreseeable future, any um, funding plan for those downtown uh, bridges along the Lifeline routes, and that certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, ODOT is focusing right now on the 205 corridor that connects Washington into Oregon on down to I-5. Um, the bridge that connects Washington and Oregon is a lot newer um, than the CRC, so it really makes sense from ODOT's statewide perspective to invest in that corridor, so that really leaves it up to the county to invest in a, um, that link that's um, downtown along the regionally established lifeline route, and um, that link is the Burnside Bridge. And you know, you may wonder why was the Burnside identified as a lifeline route, and if you zoom out, it's quite a straight shot in, uh, from Washington County to Gresham. It's wide, it's got five lanes of traffic along it, and then also there's very few overpasses that are built over Burnside that could collapse, could collapse on top of it after a major earthquake. So it's really our best uh, option if we're going to look at um, the next uh, investment uh, for our region around resiliency. And like Jay said, I mean, it takes decades and decades of planning and preparation, and so this is the county's plan um, for the next uh, 10 or 15 years or so. Thank you. I've got another question for you, but um, first for our radio audience. This is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Jessica Vega-Peterson, Multnomah County Commissioner for District 3. With me today are Megan Neal, Engineering Services Manager at Multnomah County, Jana Papa FMEU, Planning and Community Resilience Manager with the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, Jay Wilson, Resilience Coordinator for Clackamas County, and Yume Wang, Geotechnical Engineer, Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. So Megan, back to you. We've heard um, that from Yume that um, recovery efforts can be quite lengthy after um, the earthquake. How do the needs around recovery and resiliency affect how you think about an earthquake-ready Burnside Bridge? Um, I think what really um, drives um, our process around how we're delivering the Burnside Bridge project is the uh, county values, namely um, equity and um, protecting the most vulnerable of our community. Um, as we are doing our outreach around the project, we're making every effort to make sure that every voice is heard, that we have a very inclusive and broad public outreach process where we, our goal through the pro, throughout the project has always been we don't want to have one member of this community not know about our project. So we have been hitting the ground hard, talking to people, making sure everyone has an opportunity to track our progress and provide input. And then just overall, what's really um, the objective of our project is to create a connection for our community across the river and that we expect um, the community to use this bridge as a resource, as a tool in order to provide services after a major earthquake and just get the people to the services they need and then the, getting the services to the people. So I think just at the core of 
uh, the project is um, an investment in our community and trying to support our community. I think that um, idea of community in terms of resiliency is very important because re research has shown that after a major earthquake, it's our neighbors that we will rely on the most for basic provisions. Jana, what can you tell us about the steps the city is taking to help Portland's communities coordinate and prepare out loud? Thanks. I love that question because a statistic we often cite in emergency management is that after a disaster, people who are physically rescued, like pulled from the floodwaters or dug from the rubble, 95% of them are rescued by neighbors or bystanders and not by professional rescuers. So it's really true that your neighbors are the people that you have to count on. And in that regard, Portlanders can feel really good knowing that the city of Portland has one of the strongest neighborhood emergency team programs in the US. We have more than 1,700 trained volunteers and an equal number that are on the waiting list to be trained. When you go through the net training, you get 30 hours of basic training in how to do things like triage and first aid, putting out false small fires, and rescuing people from collapsed buildings. So, so I, um, a question that I get a lot from people are, um, Okay, I haven't done, you know, it's like a confession. I haven't actually done anything to prepare for the earthquake. So, um, so and, and they, you know, and they know that I work on the Burnside Bridge and I'm not the expert. So now that I have you who is the expert, what does research and experience tell us is the most important thing to prepare? Yeah, a lot of people, when you say preparedness, they think about water bottles and granola bars. It's good to have a kit, but the truth is uh, the first, the the most important to th have thing to have in a disaster is a friend. So if people were gonna do one thing this weekend to get prepared at home, I would say it would be have a conversation with people in your household about what your plan is to reconnect after an event like an earthquake. And if you've already done that, it's gonna be hot this weekend, it would be a great weekend to reach out to someone in your neighborhood, maybe someone that um, you think you might be able to help out or someone you'd like to check on you and ask them how they're doing in the heat. And let that be the beginning of a conversation about how you can help each other out in a disaster. Once you've done that, if your household has capacity, it also makes sense to get some supplies together. Our guideline is generally, if you can afford it, to buy two weeks or more of food and to store water at your house. If you camp, you probably already have some equipment there that you could use. Great. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion in the news around the city's recent policies to seismically upgrade unreinforced masonry buildings. Can you help us understand the significance of these buildings and why this has been such a focus? Sure. So unreinforced masonry buildings are brick or block buildings that were constructed before about 1960. They don't have any steel reinforcement reinforcing bars inside, so they're very brittle, and when the ground shakes, they're very much at risk of collapse. FEMA says they're the most dangerous building type in an earthquake. The city of Portland has 1,650 URM buildings that we know of, and that means we have the most of any on the West Coast. Tens of thousands of people pass through URM buildings in Portland every day. They are schools, churches, community centers, apartment buildings, and a lot of offices. So we've been working over the last four years to try and develop strategies to reduce our risk from URM buildings. They can be retrofitted, but the retrofits are expensive and a lot of building owners don't see a path forward to pay for that. So I'm sure it's an issue we're gonna continue to work at and look for resources, including at the state level, to support that. But we have had a couple steps forward in the last year. Um, one is the city council of Portland has indicated in the next year they'll be looking to mandate retrofits for public safety buildings, for schools, and for large community gathering spaces like community centers. We're also expecting to start signing unreinforced masonry buildings in the city of Portland. So sometime next year, you'll probably see a sign on near the entrance to your own buildings that just more broadly shares information about the risk so that at least people can make their own decisions. Great, and as you're saying that, I can't help but think, uh, if, wonder if this is an unreinforced masonry building or not. Um, <laughs> so um, this is a question um, for, for all of you, whoever wants to answer it. Um, Megan talked a little bit about um, the way that Multnomah County values are, are leading and shaping the work of the Burnside Bridge Project. How are governments, other governments, thinking about equity in terms of preparedness? 
From the state government level, uh, we've been thinking about schools, which are the hearts of communities, and emergency response facilities. Uh, so fire stations, police stations, hospitals since 2001. There have been laws that require seismic safety of these structures and they're very important for community resilience. So in 2007, the agency I work for conducted a statewide needs assessment to see what's the overall risk of these structures all across our 200 and some cities. And in 2009, the state has been issuing grant funds. So over $300 million have been provided to schools all across the state. And over, 600, over $60 million has been provided to emergency response facilities. And we think that this will help with community resilience across the state. I'll say at the city level, uh, we, I mentioned before our neighborhood emergency teams, which is a great program, but we also realized that that level of volunteer engagement is not something that's possible for everyone in Portland. And so uh, we're increasingly looking to be more present in historically underserved communities. There's research from, you can think of every major disaster you've seen on the news probably in the last 10 years to see that those frontline communities, historically underserved communities, meaning communities of color, communities in poverty, people with disabilities, immigrant and refugee communities, they get hit first and worst in disasters. And so we see that our work really needs to be centered there. Um, in the last year, we've kicked off some interesting partnerships working with affordable housing providers to think about how we can keep caches of emergency supplies in their large buildings and have their residents be more engaged with our NET team members. Um, we're, I'm really pleased we're doing a pilot class at the Boys and Girls Club this summer that's been well received and we're looking to be more engaged with youth. Um, and we're also just beginning some, some work with culturally specific community groups to think about how our community outreach can, can be more present in those communities in partnership with other trusted organizations. And I'll just round that out with um, the state level, as the former chairman of the Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Commission, OSPAC, um, when we wrote the Oregon Resilience Plan uh, and delivered it in 2013, it was brought to our attention very strongly that we focused a lot on infrastructure, which was what we were asked to do. And so going forward from there, we decided to focus on community resilience. And over two legislative cycles, we provided a lot of testimony and advocacy for what we called mass displacement planning, which is more than just looking at shelters or caring for folks or transitional housing. It's thinking of it holistically and, and certainly identifying the, the, the vulnerable population base in many of those areas that would be displaced first, have the hardest time with resources, and having a voice in the process. And so. Uh, OSPAC is just finishing up the recommendations that they're going to take into the next legislative session for uh, a path forward on working on that area. It's very complicated and um, I dare say it's in and of itself it could constitute a process as big as the original Oregon Resilience Plan. But it's community focused, not infrastructure focused. And I think um, it's, it, they're setting a, a very good foot forward going into the next cycle. Great. So we've talked a lot about governments. Um, I'm curious, though, from the business perspective, what are some examples of how employers are stepping up to create a culture of preparedness? I can jump in. Um, and it, so as a, a bridge owner, a member of the bridge owner community, um, we generally um, have, we practice uh, bridge inspections, post-disaster earthquake assessment of our bridges so that we are prepared to relay that information um, out to the community, up to the deciders, um, the governance that would likely come together after a disaster to make key decisions. And then just internally, we, um, you know, we, have, to, we have discussions, and I feel like that is probably um, the key fact, uh, uh, the key way that employers can be prepared is just talk about it. Um, what is your kid at home uh, contain? Uh, what can we do better as part of a safety committee to um, uh, help our program, help keep people get back to work and back to their jobs so that they can support the community? 
And I'll just say Clackamas County has been working for the past several years uh, on a program called the Employee Preparedness Campaign. It goes beyond just the continuity of operation planning that uh, most of us all do by default. Uh, but it's a 12-week program that um, individual employees can participate in uh, to learn more about the hazards uh, in their area, but they have take-home assignments every week of measuring how many underpasses and overpasses they cross, what's their home insurance, homeowner's insurance like, uh, preparing uh, two weeks' worth of, of uh, supplies, uh, but all of it's in kind of a, a very highly transparent and somewhat competitive fashion. Uh, to get employee buy-in, uh, and but but there's it generates a lot of enthusiasm for this, and so um, I think it's a good uh, example of how to do that. Great. So um, getting prepared at a personal level is a little overwhelming. It seems time-consuming, and we've heard a little bit about how getting prepared at a government level is expensive. How should we think um, about um, in terms of cost of preparedness and how? Do we think about um, making the investments in terms of resiliency versus response? That's a great question. And um, I, would, uh, I would say if we wait until the earthquake occurs, the downtime that we're going to experience and the cost of, of basically doing nothing or even the status quo that we're doing every day um, is going to set us back for, for years, if not a decade or more. Um, the cost of a bridge replacement uh, in real dollars is, is very small to the value that that bridge provides every day, but also post-disaster when you would need that bridge the most. That would be the exact hardest time to get it replaced and the most expensive time to do it. And when most of the infrastructure that we're talking about is way beyond its design life cycle anyway, and it, was, it wouldn't survive the earthquake when it was brand new, and so we, we're counting on lots of buildings and, and structures that are decades, if not even some schools 100 years old. You know, the imperative for us to act is important. The, but leveraging the disaster to get a new energy efficient, you know, modern school that actually performs well too is, is the biggest bang for the buck. And so new development, new construction to higher standards is very cost effective and it's, it's a very smart decision. Maybe just tagging on to what Jay said, I think often um, wh what we look for is to find the no regrets investments. Um, I, at a household level, that making friends with your neighbors is the, is the easiest example of that, because what if the earthquake never happens and you wasted all that time being friends, right? Like, it's, <laughs> it's not a lost investment. But I, So I think there are a lot of things at the household level about having a little, um, having a little more of a cushion so you don't have to run to the store. It, it can simplify things in your own life and at a government level similarly when we look at the, the hundreds of millions of dollars of capital investment we make every year as a, as a state that we, sh that we should be building resilience into all the projects that we do. Wonderful. Um, so what have you found that motivates people to get prepared? And what motivates people to pay for preparedness? Okay, I have to jump in on this one too because we've been trying to figure this out. Um, the Bureau of Emergency Management last year in Portland, we did a statistically valid poll of Portlanders to try and understand if they under knew about their earthquake risk and how prepared were they. What we saw is that 83% of Portlanders understand that earthquakes, earthquakes can happen here and that earthquakes are our greatest risk. What we also saw is that knowing that made no difference in whether or not they were actually prepared at home. <laughs> and less than half of people had, had made efforts to prepare. So we did some focus groups to try and dig into that a little bit more. And what we saw was really motivating is that people tend not to get prepared for themselves. They tend to say, well, I'll get by, it's okay, I can, I can put up with a lot. But people tend to get prepared for someone else that they care about. People will get prepared for their children. People will get prepared because they know their mom is counting on them. People who won't get prepared for themselves will get prepared for their dog because they don't want to think about it, no, them never coming home to let it out again. So, I, so I, to me, that's, that's really says something nice about human nature, but people tend to get prepared because out of love. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I'm an engineer. I know that wood frame homes, I, I live in a small wood frame home on flat ground. 
And yes, I knew that it could be damaged. It was built in 1950 without enough uh, seismic reinforcement. But after I saw the shelters from Hurricane Katrina, <laughs> that is when I decided we're going to shelter at home. We're not going to go to one of those public shelters. And that's what motivated, motiv motivated me to uh, make sure that our home was anchored. And uh, then we were able to drop our earthquake insurance because we anchored our home instead. Um, one of the things I think as a society we need to make sure is that our schools are safe because we've seen around the world mass casualties at schools and it's not just the immediate loss, it's really generations upon generations of loss. Well, I'd just like to take this to the next step and kind of translating this difference between preparedness and resilience because it's something that comes up a lot. And, Striving for resilience to me is an outcome-based effort that's additive to everything you're doing to put you in a better place. And so it encompasses preparedness and response and risk reduction. Um, but I think if you can talk about resilience as a cultural value and something that we all would share, um, I think it helps to leverage the disaster to get what you need right now. It's not just to get that thing that may or may not ever happen, as, as John has said about, you made friends with your neighbors now. You know, you don't regret that. And so th thinking through a resilience lens about investing in things that we know are, are vulnerable means you get an enhanced new version of whatever that is that can provide a, a needed asset for the community now, and then you get the dividend, as the Rockefeller Foundation says, when the disaster happens, because you built it to an an added level of value and delivery. Um, and so thinking about r how resilience can inform a lot of the decisions we're making for things that need to be replaced or need to be adapted, um, I think um, is a very strong way of capitalizing on strong investments that, that make a difference right now instead of, uh, you know, on some uncertain future. So when we talk about um, how we're preparing for a seismic event, I always um, can't help but think of what we need to do to help the needs of the most vulnerable community members. So seniors, people with disabilities, even young children. What are some of the considerations that we have to um, think about in those situations and what's being done for those community groups? Well, I think um, the answer is in part that people rely on the support systems and the networks after the disaster that they were aware of before the disaster. So work that we do now to strengthen programs that, that serve those communities and to build resilience into those systems so that people can continue to rely on their regular caregiver or their regular services after a disaster is really important. And in terms of equity, I think that that's a place that it makes sense to, um, to to prioritize investment. I'd also say it comes back to that, um, the statement I made at the beginning, if you're gonna do one thing this weekend to get prepared, it's to check on a neighbor, particularly if you know uh, someone in your circle of your community or your street that is a person with this disability or who's older, that's a gr that's, you can be a part of that solution by stopping by their house and asking them how they're doing in this hot weather. Well, uh, having a, a public health nurse as a, as a spouse has greatly informed my appreciation of the complexity uh, and, and of so many people who manage, for example, their health care at home right now. Um, and this, this kind of ties into that, um, that upcoming OSPAC uh, mass displacement planning. Because there's, there's a lot of services out there that keep people basically right at the edge of, of walking the line of keeping their health care supported and managed. But if, you, if they lose power, if they lose access to those support services, they can quickly uh, spiral. And um, if you take people out of their homes uh, and that familiarity, that also um, can have a huge impact. And so I think the, the work really is with the, the, the demographic shift in our populations with, with so many people, more older folks, wanting to stay at home is really trying to tie that into community scale planning um, and people tipping in uh, at, at the neighborhood and community level for the sake of um, that 
social fiber, that, that we all have a sense of belonging and identity where we are, that makes a difference, as I said, every day, but in a disaster, that's the dividend right there, as you know your neighbors and you have a, a much more general sense of what everyone's needs are collectively. Okay, thank you. So um, we have just a, a, a couple minutes or so, um, but I'm curious from each of your perspectives, what is the one thing that you wish everyone had in their car or had in their home? Well, I uh, think that it's really important for all of us to be thinking about water. If you, you know, everyone wants fast internet or, you know, their cell phone to work, <laughs> but in a disaster, you want clean water. And if you don't have clean water in about three days, you can die. So if you're, so, you know, think about water, you can store water, you can have filters, you can have water purification tablets. I have all three. <laughs> um, and, you know, make sure that you don't get dehydrated, you can't think, and that you just have plenty of water. And the other thing, if I can choose to, is I have lots of fire extinguishers at home in case my neighbors don't. Small fires can turn into big fires, and so I have 10. Yay, that's great. That's a high bar. That's brilliant. I love that. I would just maybe tagging on to yours, you may, is uh, have a flashlight. Keep a couple in your car and at your house. Um, that's, after an earthquake, the power's going to be out everywhere, and it will be scary if you're far from home and you don't even have a light. I have kids, so I have a sense of wanting to keep them feeling safe, and that makes a difference. Also, if you don't have a flashlight, you will be tempted to light candles, and then you will need you may to come with her fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> so I always encourage people to uh, keep a comfortable pair of shoes with them in their car because more than likely you will be walking home. <laughs> Yep, no, yeah. no, okay, you're okay. Um, you'll more than likely be uh, walking home from your, um, from your work if it happens during the day, and um, it's going to take a long time. Uh, that was going to be my answer. Uh, <laughs> I sat in traffic for two or three hours uh, in late 2009 when we had an afternoon snowfall that crippled the, the whole area, and uh, I put chains on immediately and was driving home and I saw so many cars that had been abandoned. I saw so many people walking without flashlights in, in these kinds of shoes or those kinds of shoes in snow and ice in the dark. And so it was a strong motivator for me to have that level of readiness because you're so insulated from the environment when you're in your car, this little bubble. But even in the heat out there right now, if you were stuck somewhere and stranded and didn't have water or didn't have the right things to survive. You know, your car gives you, a, in some ways, a very false sense of security in between your work and home. So think of it as your, your outpost. Thank you all. So for our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Jessica Vega-Peterson, Multnomah County Commissioner for District 3. With me today are Megan Neal, Engineering Services Manager at Multnomah County, Jana Papa FMU, Planning and Community Resilience Manager with the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, Jay Wilson, Resilience Coordinator for Clackamas County, and Yu Mei Wang, Geotechnical Engineer, Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Now let's go to the audience for some questions. Everyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. If you've written a question on an index card, hold it high for City Club staff to collect. You can also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. To City Club members who would like to ask a question at the microphone, please identify yourself as a member and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. Hi, I'm Kathy Moyd, member of the City Club. And as a resident of downtown, I've become very dependent on the public transit. And neither the trolleys nor the maxes go over the Burnside Bridge. And I'm just wondering if there's work going on to kind of get them to act as feeders into buses that can go across the bridge or other ways of keeping most of the public transit going while still having only the one bridge. Yep, um, great question. So we are uh, working into the plans for um, our 
vision for the future Burnside to be a multi multimodal facility. So uh, currently the streetcar has identified Burnside as part of their future expansion plans. And it sort of makes sense that um, from going across Burnside, you can then reach Sandy, which connects you to the airport, which uh, sounds very helpful. So we are making sure that um, any of the design criteria that we select now does not preclude the addition of the streetcar in the future. And this is something the county has done historically. The Selwood Bridge, in fact, is built to be streetcar ready, should that be um, in the works for the future. Um, in terms of TriMet, uh, we are uh, constantly in contact about the bus needs um, for the bridge. There's currently three lines that go over there now and we are working on a plan to um, look into a bus only lane for out of town travel to help deal with the congestion we see on the bridge uh, during rush hour. Um, as far as the light rail discussion, um, uh, they're really focused on the steel bridge right now and um, thinking about potential um, uh, adjustment to the line over that bridge. Uh, they uh, did consider Burnside as an alternative to the steel bridge, but it did not advance very far in the feasibility study plans. Hi, Carolyn Harris Crown, City Club member. This past year, my daughter brought home an earthquake preparedness plan. This was part of her health class at Cleveland High School, and I was really impressed. You know, what a double whammy. The kids are getting families engaged, but in five or 10 years, these kids are young adults out in our community, able to take care of themselves and able to take care of our neighbors. Was this a one-off, or are all of our teenagers uh, getting this through their schools? I think we're looking at each other like maybe it was a one-off, but I think it's fantastic. <laughs> but I, uh, our, I'll, speaking for my bureau, we have been looking to be uh, more engaged with with youth for for a lot of reasons. Uh, that it's a way to create culture change, as you say, um, because it pulls in families, and also because um, it helps us engage a more diverse cross section when you're in public schools than almost any place you could go. So we we are working to have uh, like neighborhood emergency teams that are school-based, and we've done some one-offs like that, but I don't think we, we produced that one. So I'm glad to hear someone's doing the same work. I know that the state requires schools to have two earthquake drills a year, and those in the tsunami zone are also required to do tsunami drills. And one of the great opportunities is to do uh, a tsunami, uh, uh, an earthquake drill uh, in October. There's a national event called the Great Shakeout this year it's October 18th, and it's at 8:18, and that's when uh, people are encouraged to do this drop, cover, and hold on. That's how you protect yourself. And then there's this uh, Great Shakeout Plus, where in addition to doing just the drop, cover, and hold on drill, uh, folks are encouraged to do something else. For example, Jay mentioned the uh, storm a few years ago, where in some schools, uh, the children were stuck at school for a lot longer than they had planned and the parents couldn't get back to them. So having some family reunification plans in place is just one other example. So I have a, a note card question here, um, and I'm going to ask it because it's actually a question that I have. Um, the New Yorker article said that tsunamis are one of the least survivable natural disasters. In the big one, how far east would a tsunami reach, and is Portland in its path? Um, no. Um, this question comes up almost every time I'm publicly speaking, and um, I'd, I'd like to assure uh, folks, based on all the science that I'm aware of, the estimates are that the, the impact from the, the inundation levels will mostly uh, only affect the, the, the very mouth of the Columbia River due to the, the nature of the, the opening there, due to the offshore bathymetry, due to the force of the river itself, that we don't expect to see any damaging levels. There may be a, a registration on a tide gauge, but that's not, that's not part of our situation here. And then, of course, the low-lying communities on the coast are at risk, especially, um, you know, 
is communities like Seaside. So one of the real victories uh, recently is although Seaside School District has tried to pass bonds in the past, they finally actually passed one. So by next fall, <laughs> yes, um, they will be able to, uh, all, the, all the school children will be able to attend schools that are above the tsunami zone. It's about 80 feet elevation and above and far away from right along the coastline area. So it's real, real kudos to them. Paul Milius, uh, <clears throat> club member, and I am an NAT member in the Irvington Net uh, uh, group. Um, <clears throat> are there any plans being made to marshal uh, watercraft like the Portland Spirit, uh, the other tour boats, the jet boats that run up and down the Willamette as ferry transportation uh, where you could have, uh, you know, a, a, a planned a wharf, a boarding point that public transit could get to, people would then take uh, a ferry across the river to get to their jobs or you know, back uh, across. Any plans along those lines? We have had some very, at the Bureau of Emergency Management for Portland, we have had in the past some very preliminary discussions with, with boat owners and an organization of commercial boat owners about, uh, about using their craft in that way. Um, and I'm, I think in the recovery period, um, as we start to build back, that there may be a way that boats fit into that because we know there would still be really capacity issues crossing the river. The thing is, immediately following an earthquake, the river may be likely so full of debris and hazardous materials that have spilled or sewage that has spilled into the river that it would be really hazardous to try and navigate the river right after an earthquake. Hello, I'm Ann Castleton. Uh, I am actually the continuity of operations planner for the city, but I'm also a net member and I'm part of the city club earthquake advocacy committee. So um, I, I guess my big question is one of the things we've worked so hard on in the city club earthquake advocacy to get um, the recommendations uh, looked at and um, moved forward is the critical energy infrastructure hub. And it doesn't seem like you've talked about that so much. You may, I can see that you're grabbing your microphone. Um, <clears throat> so this is mainly for you, May, but for anybody else there, what that it seems to me like the biggest risk that 90% of the energy for the state comes through that hub. What do you think should happen? Yes. Yeah, so, a few years back, the Oregon Department of Energy, the Oregon PUC, which has regulatory authority on certain uh, energy facilities and the agency I work for, looked at the energy sector across Oregon. So that includes liquid fuel, natural gas, and electricity. So liquid fuel like petroleum. And the Achilles heel for the state um, is really how we obtain our liquid fuel uh, through this uh, critical Energy Infrastructure Hub, or CEI Hub, just uh, downstream from here in North-ish Portland. Um, all, really, all of our, our uh, fuel tank farms are built along the river's edge where there is a very high liquefaction concern, where the soils, loose sandy soils, can temporarily turn into liquid. And anything built on it, anything built in it, like pipelines, uh, piers where, where, there's, uh, uh, where, where boats can, can unload and offload, uh, these can all be damaged. In addition, the, the structures themselves, many of them are over 100 years old. There's tanks over 100 years old and certainly not designed for seismic uh, shaking in any way. And so City Club has looked at this and made recommendations and thus far what has happened is the Oregon Solutions, it's a nonprofit based out of Portland State, is doing an assessment to see if they are able to take this on as a project of theirs. And what they would be looking at is how can they bring people together in a collaborative way to figure out what are the biggest problems and how to move us forward. And at the same time, the state is looking at the governor's office and the state commission that uh, Jay mentioned, OSPAC, uh, will soon, after they uh, provide their recommendations on mass care and mass displacement, be looking at the regulatory aspects. What kind of regulation might be put 
uh, forth on, on, uh, on this industry in this area so that we don't, uh, so that we can do better. I just want to quickly say the Critical Energy Hub is the nexus between climate adaptation and seismic risk. It's, it's where sustainability and resilience come together. Uh, it's where the, our dependence on oil and our oil-based economy is so vulnerable and that, that if the failure of that hub happens in an earthquake, it's going to create an environmental catastrophe right at the mouth of the Willamette and the Columbia that I'm calling our Fukushima. A uh, very different scale, but uh, the, the, no one's going to be able to respond to an environmental release of all of that material right into that, that nexus of those two rivers. And so I'm urging those who are involved in the climate adaptation uh, to, to tie this into their uh, meaningful conversations around seismic safety too. This is a perfect place for all of those to align to, to work on this. And, oh, and now we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. <laughs> Our time is up and we do need to pause the discussion for now, but we really hope you'll continue these conversations in your communities. Our weekly programming is made possible by generous sponsors and I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this week, Earthquake Tech, thank you. And thank you panelists. Also, thank you to our panelists and to Jessica and today for, to Emerald Bogue for putting today's program together. Thank you all for coming. We're adjourned. <laughs>